O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Praise to you, O Christ, Lamb of our salvation. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted and deliver, in you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from birth. And from my mother's womb, you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me. Like a ravening and roaring lion, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a, compass, a company of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. And all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him, shall bow, and all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generations. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to people yet unborn that he has done it. The Passion of Our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. John, the 19th chapter. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. 
they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He enters his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone of Pavement. In Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts. One part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Mary were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, To fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. 
since it was the day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked that Pilate break the legs, that the Pilate might break the legs and that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once there came out blood and water. He who saw it has borne witness. His testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And then again, another scripture says, they will look on him who they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So they came and took away his body. Nicodemus also who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So they took the body of Jesus, bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. O oh Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven and whose sin is put away. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the propitiation of our sins. He was delivered up to death. He was delivered for the sins of the people. In our first six midweek Lenten sermons, we focused on what is seen through the eyes of various characters in the Passion. We saw the perspectives of Judas, Peter, the chief priests and the scribes, Pontius Pilate, the Roman soldiers, and the Jewish crowd. Last night, we meditated on how there is much more than meets the eye going on at the Last Supper. Tomorrow night, we are going to have a Vesper service at 6.30 where we'll have a, a sermon about the, uh, pardon me, I lost my spot here, about the sealed tomb of Jesus and the sorrow of the women. And then on Sunday, we'll look at the empty tomb through the eyes of the Easter angel. But tonight... Tonight, we're going to view Jesus' crucifixion through God's eyes. What God the Father, what God the Son, and what God the Holy Spirit saw, and what they accomplished at the cross for us men and for our salvation. What did God the Father see on Good Friday? He saw His only begotten Son suffering and dying unjustly on a Roman cross. Can you imagine watching your child die in this way? It's unfathomable. As sinful mortals, 
We cannot understand what it's like to be immortal, to be holy God, but surely the Father's heart must have been grieved beyond words. Yet what's even more unfathomable is that God loves you. And not only that He loves you, but He loves you so much that He's willing to inflict this on His beloved Son. Paul wrote that the Father did not spare His own Son, but gave Himself up, gave Him up for us. And that God shows His love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait around for us to clean up our act first, but while we were ungodly, while we were still enemies of God, He slaughtered His Son in our place. And under His righteous anger against sin in the world. This means, whether you realize it or not, we provoked the death of Jesus. On Pentecost, St. Peter preached, This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, was crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. The Father gave the Son to the world, but you crucified and killed him. Yes, Peter is also talking to you and me. He isn't just offering some anti-Jewetic rant, but it's indictment against all sinners. Whether a sinner lived in the first century or the 21st century, the guilt and the blame is all the same. We all crucified the Son of God by our sin. I wish we could have been singing because there's a couple of Lenten hymns. This is uh, verse 4 of hymn 453. I caused your grief and sighing by evils multiplying. As countless as the sands, I caused the woes unnumbered with which your soul is cumbered, your sorrow raised by wicked hands. Another one we sing is 448, verse 3. O child of woe, who struck the blow that killed our gracious master, it was I, thy conscious cries, I have wrought disaster. As we acknowledge our sin and our worthy unworthiness, we need to see ourselves nailing Jesus to the tree of the cross. But at the same time, His crucifixion, as we just read, was according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God the Father. What value did the Father see in this plan? The Father saw, and now all of us see, God's own glory being manifested in the world. This is what Jesus prayed for. Just hours before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed. It says he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. The Father and the Son both glory and having mercy on sinners. That's what they accomplished during Christ's perfect life, His suffering, His death, and His resurrection. The Father sees all of your sin taken upon Jesus on the cross. Even the sin of crucifying His Son. Moreover, 
He sees his wrath against sin being poured out on the sun and the gates of hell prevailing over him. Yes, hell is being under God's wrath. And that's what the Father sees Jesus taking in your place to save you. Now for the Son's perspective. Jesus always knew that his name means the Lord saves. So he sees himself as the object of the Father's wrath, but also as the subject of your salvation. He drinks the Father's wrath, drawn down to its dregs, finally crying out from the abandonment from his Father, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But this is no cry of despair. He suffers abandonment from his father. He suffers the pains of a sinner condemned to hell. But still he looks at the father with perfect love and trust. My God, he cries with unbroken faith with the words, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He breathes his last he knows his Father still loves him and will raise him from the dead on the third day. On Good Friday, what does Jesus see when he looks at, at you and me and all sinners? He recognizes you as the cause of his woe. But he doesn't hold it against you. The Lamb of God bears this willingly. He wants nothing other than for you to be saved and for Him to be your Savior. He looks at you and then He prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He stares into your sinful eyes and says, I love you all the same. And I and my Father love you so much that we would make this sacrifice for you. I am offering myself under the Father's wrath in your place to save you from your sins and to spare you from hell. So then finally we must ask, what, what does the Holy Spirit see? First, He sees the Son and comes to Jesus' aid as he offers his life as a ransom to the Father. We don't know the ins and outs of this, but the epistle to the Hebrews says that Christ, through the eternal Spirit, offered himself without blemish to God, thus accomplishing your redemption by the blood of the cross. Jesus had received the Spirit without measure in His baptism. And we know that the Spirit is the helper. So it makes sense that the Holy Spirit not only helps Jesus fulfill all righteousness during His earthly ministry, but also helped Him offer Himself to the Father on the cross. Second, on Good Friday, the Spirit sees that everything necessary for the salvation of sinners is achieved by the Son. Again, Jesus had promised just hours before His death, He said, when the Spirit of truth comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me. For he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Here we see the Holy Trinity working together in their natural, perfect harmony. The Father gave the Son the task of redeeming mankind. The Son willingly took this task upon Himself. And the Holy Spirit joyfully proclaims the message to you. So many enjoy the benefits of the Son's sacrificial death. The Spirit takes what is Christ's 
and he declares it to you. He takes the righteousness of Jesus and it stills it in the waters of holy baptism to make it a life-giving water, rich in grace and washing of a new birth into God's eternal kingdom. He takes the forgiveness of Jesus and declares it to you through the gospel and through the words of absolution. And he presents to you the body given and the blood shed for you on the cross to be received for forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation in Holy Communion. On Good Friday, God's eyes see everything necessary to save you from sin, death, and hell. Although your own eyes look upon your guilt, your unworthiness, your impurity, the Father looks upon your sin, forgiven for Christ's sake. The Son credits His own righteousness to your account. The Holy Spirit makes you a participant in the holiness of Jesus. You're baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So keep this truth on your mind. Keep it in your heart. And keep it before your eyes at all times. When God looks at you, He sees the apple of His eye. His beloved child, united with Christ in death and raised up to new eternal life with Him. Amen. May the peace of God which passes all human understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowliness of his handmaiden, for behold, from this day all generations will call me blessed. For the Mighty One has done great things to me, and, his, and holy is His name. And His mercy is on those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arms. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has cast down the mighty from their thrones, and has exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Lord Jesus Christ, on this most holy night in which we remember your passion, Grant that we may continuously fix our eyes on you, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joys set before you endured the cross, scorning the shame and took up your eternal throne at God's right hand. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We thank you for enduring flogging and death in our place. As you were crowned with thorns before your passion, so may now may we be given the crown of life for the sake of your merits. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As Pilate declared you guiltless and your father vindicated your innocence by raising you from the dead, grant that we may enjoy a guiltless conscience now by your forgiveness and a verdict of innocence on judgment day for the sake of your righteousness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. The inscription above your sacred head on the cross rightly declared you the King of the Jews. May we always worship you as the King of glory and live under you in your kingdom and serve you in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As you saw to the care of your mother by entrusting her to the beloved disciple, so may we also faithfully care for those whom you have placed in our lives. 
Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your thirst for our salvation led you to endure the cross for us. May we thirst for your righteousness above all other things during the, our pilgrimage here below. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By your death, you finished all the work necessary for our justification. Grant us likewise the strength to do the good works you have prepared for us between now and the day our lives are finished. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We praise you for the water and the spirit and the blood with which you have blessed us in your holy word and sacraments by baptism, by absolution and your holy supper. Continue to pour out your grace upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As your tomb was a fitting resting place for your sacred body, may we likewise find the grave to be a place of rest until we greet you on the day of resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank and praise you for all that you have done for us. Come quickly that we might soon enjoy the fulfillment of all that you came to accomplish. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Please join me as we pray the prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this, your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men, to suffer death upon the cross, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you willed that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross, and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks that of our Lord's passion that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.